In 1871, naturalist Charles Darwin, working without the benefit of the fossil record or modern genetic research, proposed that humans and African apes must have shared a common ancestor. Today, thanks to a variety of anatomical and molecular studies, we know that our closest living relative is the African chimpanzee. Incredibly, our two species share about 98% of the same genes. But this close relationship doesn't mean that we evolve from chimpanzees, nor does it mean that chimpanzees will evolve into humans. What it does mean is that millions of years in the past, we shared a common ancestor. As we journey back in time, our ancestors begin to look less like us and more and more ape-like. The fossil record gives us some important clues about where we come from. Eight million years ago, during a period known as the Miocene, a major portion of the African continent was covered in lush forests. A great diversity of apes thrived in these forests, feeding, sleeping, and easily navigating this world above ground. Evolutionary adaptations in their anatomy, such as grasping toes and joint mobility in arms and shoulders, made the apes extremely successful animals in this arboreal environment. But beginning about six million years ago, the world became a much drier and colder place. The African forests, home to the Miocene apes, started to thin and were gradually replaced by open woodlands. Although most of the ape species went extinct, in time a few began to adapt to the newer climate. One species that survived was the common ancestor of the African apes and humans. Three and a half million years ago, at the beginning of the rainy season in what is now Tanzania, a volcano we know as Sadaman erupted. The eruption covered the surrounding landscape with an ash that was fine and gritty, much like beach sand. And then it rained. Moistened ash from sediment became a type of natural cement, recording the tracks of many animal species who walked across it that day. Monkeys, rhinos, giraffes, and incredibly, two of our own ancestors, hominids. They were probably from Lucy's species, Australopithecus afarensis. Unearthed in 1978 by Mary Leakey and her excavation team, the Lytoli footprints are unique and dramatic evidence for one of the defining characteristics of being a hominid, bipedalism. Walking upright requires a unique set of anatomical features, and one of the most obvious features is the structure of the human foot. Unlike chimps who have a divergent big toe used for grasping, the human big toe is in line with the other toes and helps to propel the body forward. The human condition is clearly preserved in the Lytoli footprint. To better understand the origins of upright walking, we need to look even deeper into our ancestral past. Nina Jablonski, curator of anthropology at the California Academy of Sciences, is a paleoanthropologist who studies bipedalism. When you watch chimpanzees or gorillas interact with one another, they occasionally make bipedal displays in front of one another. Usually they do this when there is some kind of competition for resources among them. As soon as animals begin to be more bipedal, there are so many other things that they can then do with their forelimbs and hands. This is exactly how we think bipedalism evolved. And so a whole 
host of positive feedback mechanisms, the use of hands in feeding, in carrying, in play, in gesture. All of these things would feed into the system and propel bipedalism into a firm anatomical adaptation. Recent hominid fossil discoveries in Kenya by paleoanthropologist Meve Leakey at the site of Kanapoi near Lake Turkana have provided even older evidence for bipedalism. Roughly a million years older than Lucy, Australopithecus anamensis was even more ape-like. However, the anatomy of the shin bone indicated an upright posture and gait. So bipedalism was the initial feature that set us apart from the apes. But it wasn't until much later that evolutionary changes would set our own genus Homo apart from the Australopithecines. The hominid fossil record between two and three million years is frustratingly sparse. Yet, by roughly two million years ago, fossils assigned to Homo make an appearance. However, today, there is little agreement as to how many species of Homo actually existed. By about 1.8 million years ago, we encounter a hominid, Homo erectus, that stands in contrast to all earlier ancestors. The skeletons of this species were larger and built more like our own. And most importantly, their brains were significantly larger. Alan Walker teaches anthropology at Penn State University and conducts field research in Kenya. The brain size, body size is interesting because a large brain is one of the hallmarks of ourselves. It turns out that the easiest way to get a big brain is to get a big body. Brain size and body size are intricately linked, and it's a complicated linkage. In 1984, near Lake Jerkana in northern Kenya, Alan Walker and Richard Leakey uncovered the most complete fossil skeleton of Homo erectus ever found. Dated at roughly one and a half million years, this is the skeleton of a young male, probably about nine years old. Nicknamed the Turkana boy, he stood about five feet four inches but as an adult, he would have been at least six feet tall. Homo erectus not only had big brains, they had big bodies. And the stuff they left on the archaeological sites shows us that they were eating animals. And we suspect that they were catching them too. There are consequences to becoming a carnivore. Carnivores eat meat, and meat is meat wherever it's found. Whereas herbivores eat plants, and individual herbivore species are matched to their plant communities. Carnivores aren't like that. Carnivores have huge home ranges, so Homo erectus is pushing its own range further and further and further away from the ancestral home range by little territorial increments, and the pressure that pushes it are the numbers of Homo erectus that are still there in the ancestral homeland. This is not a migration in the sense that songbirds migrate south in the winter. This is a dispersal of a species. About a million and a half years ago, Homo erectus left Africa and began to populate the rest of the globe. In a sense, Homo erectus was the evolutionary parent of our own species. They carried with them not only advances in culture, but indelible assets that began with our earliest ancestors. With a bold, confident stride, Homo erectus crossed the threshold into a new world.